tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Jody Gutkin. I am a physical therapist and have been practicing for over 25 years. Um, and particularly with the conditions that we are discussing today, I have practiced in a multitude of settings up north in New York, Long Island, and then down here in Florida. So I've seen patients with these diagnoses throughout the continuum of care. And things have changed a lot, I can tell you, from when I learned these back in school uh, many moons ago. And there's a lot of fun research uh, that we are going to discuss. Um, I've enjoyed practicing, as I said, in acute care, outpatient, uh, inpatient rehabilitation, um, both pediatric and adult, um, home care. And I am a physical therapy educator also. I hold a master's degree in education and I'm a certified ergonomic assessment specialist. So when we talk RA, I'll uh, get a little bit into some, some tips there. Uh, so I look forward to sharing with you what I know about these conditions and what the research is showing us today. And that's one of the reasons I developed these courses, um, particularly with autoimmune disease. I really, uh, family members were asking a lot of questions, patients I was encountering, um, you know, they're on medications I didn't recognize or the presentations, they're being diagnosed earlier and, and in different ways than they were decades ago. Uh, so autoimmune diseases are, are huge. There are so many of them. I've kind of scaled it down to looking specifically at type one diabetes, multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, and systemic lupus. And what we're going to do is go over the pathophysiology, how these conditions develop, what does the research know now about the clinical presentation, and some of the new advances in medical and uh, technology to manage these conditions. And I, I never thought I could tell you when I was back in school taking those histology exams, looking under the microscope, rotating around the room, uh, dating myself, um, you know, trying to guess what the slides were, that I would love his pathology as much as I do. So we definitely talk a lot about what is going on inside the body that leads to the physical symptoms that we see in our patients. And I just think that gives us such a good base when we revisit it to understand um, how broadly the symptoms are that our patients present with. So we're going to take a look at that in an understandable manner for a Sunday morning, not, not too heavy. Uh, so we'll take a look at these different aspects and then we'll bring in some new uh, innovations that we're seeing in terms of diet and how it's impacting the autoimmune conditions. A disclaimer, as with any course that you attend, when you go back to uh, utilize this information in the clinic tomorrow, please make sure that you do so in accordance with your federal, state, and professional regulation. And this brings us to our actual start of our content for today. In order to fully understand autoimmune disease, we need to take a couple of moments and look back and refresh our memory on our different types of immunity. We have two different types of immunity that fights off uh, pathogens that uh, may enter our body. We have our humoral immunity. Those are where our B cells that develop uh, in our bone marrow and then they're going to mature are going to retain memory and engage that memory for future protection from pathogens we may encounter. And then we have our cellular immunity. And the terminology here has actually changed over time, depending on when you went to school. Our cellular immunity are our T cells. That gives us with uh, long-term immunity. Again, they develop in the bone marrow, mature in the thymus, and they tend to have more of a local effect on macrophages. Particular component of the T cells that we are going to discuss a lot today are our T regs or regulator T cells. Those are the ones that actually shut down the activity of the other B and T cells as they're fighting off pathogens, and they play a critical role in our autoimmunity, in protecting us from ourselves. These were formerly called T suppressor cells. For those of you that um, are wondering what happened to them, they just got a new name in the research. Considering our immune system, uh, there are many different conditions that can develop related to um, autoimmune diseases because it 
involves so many different components and systems within our body. There are about uh, almost 24 million uh, Americans who are presenting with autoimmune diseases. The prevalence is increasing. Under this umbrella, there are about uh, 80 to 100 different chronic disorders that fall under the category of autoimmune disease. So again, we've really scaled it back here. To understand what happens in these different conditions, we're going to take a couple minutes to talk about self-tolerance. Normally what happens when a pathogen uh, infects our body, a virus, bacteria, fungi, anything of that nature, um, we're going to attack those cells and then we're going to have debris that results from that process and the body needs to clear all of it out. I thought these were great images. They almost look like artwork, but on the left-hand side of the screen here, this is actually an image of a healthy T cell um, from an electron micrograph. And on the right-hand side here, these, here you can see them, they are actually anthrax, and the yellow is a neutrophil ingesting it. And I think this um, helps us kind of visualize that there's a lot going on at a small level that involves all of these conditions. Even though you may be treating these patients and you're thinking, well, I'm treating them for back pain, hip pain, energy conservation techniques, general fitness, um, there's a lot more going on there that affects many different systems. And self-tolerance is what it comes down to. That, generally speaking, our body um, is not recognizing those byproducts that occur from the breakdown of the different pathogens, and the body doesn't realize that fragments of that process are itself, and it starts to attack it also, just like that original foreign pathogen. So our self-tolerance, our ability to recognize our own cells and say, okay, I don't need to do anything about that, is what's impaired when we have autoimmune disease. There's many different uh, categories. Uh, we may just have hypersensitivity, your typical um, allergic reaction that activates your histamine, maybe to dust or pollen. Then we have a category of immunodeficiency where the immune system just it doesn't have the cells available in order to suppress foreign antigens, so such as HIV, hepatitis, and then we have autoimmune disease where we are focusing today, which is that loss of that self-tolerance. And we have that amplified autoimmune response. Another uh, way that we can look at this to define it a little bit more specifically, the process in general for all the different autoimmune diseases is very similar. Where the differences arise are on the specific places in this process or cells that each condition um, emphasizes. So generally speaking, we have what's called autoantigens that are present in the different autoimmune diseases. And this means that it's the body's own tissue. It's an intrinsic antigen, auto meaning self, antigen is the foreign body. So for some reason, the body is not recognizing a piece of itself as belonging to it, and it believes that it is um, foreign. So they think that they are detecting, the cells are seeing something foreign in the body, and they're going to have an autoimmune response. They are going to break down and attack those particular cells, even if it is part of a normal functioning pancreas or joint synovial layer. The body starts to break down what it thinks is foreign, and it's going to damage those tissues that we need for healthy functioning. Well, as it's breaking down these what it thinks are foreign tissues, it creates byproducts and those um, fragments of material. So now there's even more pieces that the body says, well, wait a second, we still have this foreign material, even though it's pieces of self, and we have a further amplified autoimmune response. So essentially, the body can never get rid of the triggering piece of information or cells or tissue because it's part of itself and there's an abundant supply. So it becomes a self-perpetuating response because there's a never-ending supply of what originally triggered. So these autoantigens are constantly present. So that helps us understand why most of these conditions are lifelong conditions. It also is something we need to consider when we look at, well, why does this happen? 
why does somebody start recognizing tissues that are itself as foreign to initiate this process? There are multiple factors that are considered from genetic susceptibility to environmental factors, and then uh, epigenetics will also discuss that's emerging. Genetic susceptibility, it, we know that certain conditions are more prevalent in individuals um, that maybe it's a hereditary component. Or, But either way, what we have to recognize is major histatobility uh, complex, MHC. This is a, the group of genes that are going to encode the proteins outside of our cell surfaces. And that's what helps our immune system recognize foreign from self. Well, unfortunately, in many individuals who have autoimmune disease, HLA, it's one of the specific genes in this whole complex, HLA that gives the instructions to this histocompatibility complex, so HLA gives the wrong instructions. And for some reason, it forgets to tell or gives incomplete information or inaccurate information that then does not allow MHC to recognize the body as itself. So there's some intrinsic error in the coding there that then perpetuates the disease response. In certain conditions, they're finding that there is a predisposition based on gender. And in 2016, there was an Italian study who looked at individuals um, with a sex bias related to autoimmune disease. And they're finding that the female gender tends to be more likely to develop certain autoimmune diseases. So the hypothesis was that, okay, so it's the X chromosome 
that maybe is part of the problem or it's the sex hormones, right? Our um, female hormones that are triggering this autoimmune response. So they need to understand what's causing it so we can develop better treatments and know what symptoms to look out for and manage throughout the body and recognize it earlier for treatment. So they said, okay, well, we need to figure out, is it the X chromosome or is it the um, hormones? So in this Italian study, what they looked at are individuals who had trisomy X. And they said, okay, well, if the X chromosome plays a role, we should see an increase in the different autoimmune diseases in this population. And what they're finding is that even when they looked at individuals who were prepubescent, so females who were prepubescent with trisomy X, they still had an increased risk of the um, development of lupus in particular. So they said, okay, so maybe it's not the hormones that are making a difference. Maybe it's the X chromosome itself that's playing a role. So even though there is a um, recognition that estrogens in particular play a role, we know that females tend to live longer, that estrogen tends to enhance immunity in a healthy functioning system. Unfortunately, in a system that is prone to autoimmune disease, the estrogens actually perpetuate the response and give a greater reaction. That's why we see a greater incidence in females. They also said we still need to account for the fact that in those individuals with um, the extra X chromosome, we still saw an increase in disease despite them not having reached puberty yet. So there was some additional research that is looking into this. And what they are finding is that um, in females, we have two X chromosomes and that during um, the development process, one of those X chromosomes becomes silenced, so it's not active. However, every fragment of the genetic coding does not become inactive. They say about 15% remains functioning. So they're theorizing that that little extra 15% in some individuals that is more directed towards an amplified immune response is contributing to the development of higher autoimmune disease in females. And they actually took it a step further and they said, okay, well, if that is the case, we should consider that individuals with, let's say, Turner syndrome, where they have a, a typical functioning X chromosome and then the second one is not, it's an O, they actually found a decreased risk of autoimmune disease. And when they looked at males with Klinefelters, which are XXY, they have an extra X, they had an increased risk of autoimmune disease. So that gives you a little bit of background on the genetic piece. Epigenetics are another area where the research is really emerging. And uh, the National Institute of uh, Health is looking at epigenetics as other factors that play a role in the development of disease conditions, particularly autoimmune disease. And it is something has to be turning on and off these genes that are not functioning appropriately to trigger the autoimmune cascade. So they're trying to figure out what it is. And what they're finding is that we can actually alter the turning on and off of these genes with things such as diet. And we're hearing a lot about this. So there was one particular study where they took um, mice. And these particular mice, um, here's mama, um, they tend to be um, yellow, obese, more prone to diseases like cancer and diabetes. And when they looked at the typical offspring, they found three out of the four possessed those same traits. Well, they said, OK, well, what if we change the dietary patterns? So they fed the, the uh, mouse a diet high in um, methyls, which are um, more healthy promoting uh, characteristics. And when they looked at that group of offspring, they actually found that three out of the four mice then were actually lean, brown, not prone to disease. So they said these epigenetics are playing a role somehow these other factors to consider. So we're looking at environmental factors as contributing to either triggering the autoimmune response and then potentially playing a role in its amplification.
Food additives have we've heard a lot of discussion of, and the understanding behind that is that our intestines are massive. They um, are approximately 200 square meters. They are made up of 70% lymphoid tissues. They do play a huge role in our immune response. Um, and it, they said if you spread out the surface area of the intestines, it's approximately 13 and a half times the size of a parking spot. Um, I can't even imagine that. So it plays a significant role and we need to recognize this. Normally the junctions of the cells in our intestinal mucosa are tight together. And being tight together, this epithelial um, barrier is going to control the equilibrium between tolerance of immunity and self antigens and allow our system to function normally. When we consume diets that are high in food additives, what the industry is finding is that we get what's called junctional leakage. And you may have heard this, the leaky gut. Um, the science behind it is that that internal barrier in the intestines becomes deteriorated. And what happens is it separates the junctions between the cells and it's allowing foreign substances to pass more readily into our system, and they feel that some of those things may be triggering that autoimmune cascade. It's also changing the microbiota, and that increased permeability is not allowing, and that separation of the cells is just not allowing our immune component of our intestines to function appropriately. Vitamin D is another uh, aspect of these epigenetics that is getting more attention. Vitamin D receptors are located on many of our organs, and this is go particularly D3. Um, they are finding that it's an immune modulator, so they're looking at the fact that alterations in vitamin D levels can be found in individuals who present with particularly lupus, multiple sclerosis, and type 1 diabetes. Um, we have rich vitamin binding sites on many of our organs, so that is going to come into play if you have lower vitamin D levels, that again, it may allow the opportunity for that amplified immune response. What they did between um, 1992 to 2004, they followed military personnel and they assessed their vitamin D levels and then went on to see how many of them developed different autoimmune diseases. And they actually found a relationship that individuals who had lower vitamin D levels actually had greater development of autoimmune disease. So there's something to be said of the science behind this. So after I talk about this next piece, everyone's homework is to go home and sit outside in the sun. I should follow my own advice <laughs> with that. We need to think about, well, where does our vitamin D come from? And that um, our food actually provides a little bit of the vitamin D that we need, but sunlight exposure is the main way that our body absorbs vitamin D from the UVB rays. We synthesize vitamin D, it assists with the metabolism in our liver and kidneys, and they've actually found that it plays a role in those T regulator cells. So remember, we said those T regulator cells are the ones that tell the body to kind of halt attacking itself, and it tells it to recognize itself and not lead to an autoimmune process. In Australia, I think it was in 2014, they looked at kids developing type 1 diabetes, and they saw that the incidence was rising of type 1 diabetes between the 90s and the first decade of 2000, increasing the incidence every year. But what happened? Technology over that time. So those kids were inside a lot more, playing video games and doing other things. They weren't outside as much getting the sun, and they said that that, they think, is a contributing factor. There's additional research that looks at this. Um, that certain conditions, how far you live from the equator, does actually um, show statistical correlation to the development of certain uh, autoimmune diseases, and they're connecting that to sunlight exposure and vitamin B deficiency. Particularly with multiple sclerosis, they're saying this, that the higher the latitude, um, the greater the sunlight starvation that someone experiences, so 
depending on where you live, and we have people from everywhere, Texas is about 33 degrees north, Missouri 39, Ohio is about 41. So uh, that gives us an idea. Depending on where else you are in the world, you can follow that around. Um, and then Boston, just to give you an East Coast reference, because I had to look, that's where, <laughs> where I'm from, is kind of about the level of Ohio, about 41 degrees. What they found in the research is that if you live at 42 degrees north latitude, they found that the cutaneous levels of vitamin D synthesis are negligible. There's hardly any from about November to February because of the low levels of light, sunlight exposure. The atmosphere is absorbing most of the UV rays during those winter months. We also go, we use sunscreen, we use UV films, we're just not outside as much. All these things put together, their finding is decreasing the sunlight exposure decreasing vitamin D, increased incidence of autoimmune disease. So So some very curious researchers said, okay, well, let's take this a step further. So if an adult has decreased sun exposure and decreased vitamin D, and it's dysfunctional T regulation, increased autoimmune disease, what happens to a pregnant mother? What happens to that baby, that fetus during its development? So in Scotland, they looked at babies born between 1997 and 2009. And in England, they looked at babies born between 2003 and 2009. So we're spanning several decades. Fascinating study. And what they did was they gathered information on the babies born and the development of different autoimmune disease. And then they also went back to the National um, Aeronautics Foundation and pulled all the weather data from the corresponding time periods when those moms were pregnant. I can't imagine the work that went into this study, but it made me so excited to find it. And what they confirmed was the developmental origins of health and disease hypothesis. Um, and the theory is that the intrauterine environment changes that influences the genetic coding of the baby and can increase disease later in life. And what they actually found is that babies who were born um, between April and October went on to develop a, or were more prone to develop multiple sclerosis and lupus. And they went back and looked at it and they did these calculations with sun exposure to realize that during the second trimester, it was the winter for those babies. And there was a significant decrease in sun exposure for the mom, so they're correlating that to a contributing factor. So just really interesting information. So I said, darn, if I had known that when I was pregnant decades ago, I would say, I'm going to the Caribbean, I need to just hang out and relax, <laughs> get all my sunlight in during my pregnancy. Um, looking at chemical exposures, they're finding that chemical exposures do play 
a uh, role in the development of different autoimmune disease. And here's the relevance. Besides this information being interesting, and it just it helps us understand the pathophysiology. So when we talk about the diseases themselves, they make better sense. Um, but when you're treating patients for different conditions, you need to look at them holistically and the symptoms that they're presenting with, particularly if you're just working them or orthopedically, that maybe they have something in their history of symptoms that fit another disease. So silica dust, it is um, seen, they really started seeing this back in the um, early 1900s with the stonemasons, uh, then it, the gold mining and coal mining, the increase in scleroderma and the lung inhalation led to uh, silicosis and lung disease. But they also found that these individuals went on to develop increased incidence of lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. So what they're finding is that the silica dust seems to be a potential trigger for this autoimmune cascade. So more recently, they said, okay, well, let's you know, bring this forward to the new millennium. And in 2015 in Israel, they looked at individuals who underwent lung transplants because of silica dust exposure, um, particularly from uh, artificial stone, which is probably in most of our kitchens, that leads to um, crystallizing silica that could potentially be inhaled. And they found that those individuals with the um, lung transplants, they followed them over 15 years, they actually had an increased incidence of autoimmune disease also, further um, connecting that link. And then Turkey looked at similar data because uh, believe it or not, our denim genes, the manufacturing of utensils, that sandblasting process produces silica dust. So depending on what's in your patient's history, you may be treating them possibly for a respiratory compromise, but if they start presenting other symptoms um, and they do have some of these exposures in their past, it might lead you down a referral path for them. When we look at classifications of different autoimmune diseases, we break it down into different categories. And the two that we're going to focus on today are type one immune complex autoimmune disease, and then, uh, sorry, type three autoimmune uh, complex diseases and type four cell response. And um, the big difference here is that our immune complex responses tend to be more systemic. So that'll be lupus and RA. And then type 4 tend to be more um, organ specific, uh, type 1 diabetes and multiple sclerosis. So we'll go through each of these specifically over the next couple of hours so that you have a good understanding of how they present and manage. Generally speaking, our type 3 um, immune complex responses, what normally happens when we have a pathogen in the body is that um, our macrophages are going to ingest enough of the antibodies to create crosslinks. And these crosslinks between the debris and the um, antigen are going to create these what they call complexes. And then that's going to be cleared by their reticuloendothelial system. And the body, you know, has that inflammatory reaction and then it heals itself. What happens is in the autoimmune diseases that they can never clear those autoantigens, that there are so many of those autoantigens that when they create these uh, crosslinks, because there are so many, that all of these different byproducts and these immune complexes that the body has and it's trying to clear out, it kind of just starts depositing it in different places in the body. And that's why we see more systemic responses and different um, systemic systems involved with RA and lupus because these immune complexes are getting deposited throughout the body. In type four, what happens is it's more specific. This relates more to those T regulatory cells, that the regulatory T cells are just not being shut down and down regulated to say, no, this is part of your own body, don't react to it, don't respond to it. And that's why in those conditions, we see different clinical presentations. We're gonna go through each condition and take a look at it more specifically.
rheumatoid arthritis, comparing it to osteoarthritis. With rheumatoid arthritis, um, we are seeing more of the small joints of the body impacted. Uh, osteoarthritis is that wear and tear of the larger joints of our body. Rheumatoid arthritis, they've actually found that it's more prevalent in twins and first generation relatives. So there's definitely um, a genetic contribution, they say up to 50%. And what happens is there's some type of environmental trigger and then the T cell response is going to be altered in these individuals and it leads to this chronic progressive inflammation of the joints, particularly the synovium of the small joints in the body that leads to joint deformity, subluxation, and a sequela of events. Looking specifically at the pathophysiology of rheumatoid arthritis, the key players here is um, IgG. IgG is um, an antibody, so that's going to fight off infectious uh, agents. In an individual with rheumatoid arthritis, because of their genetic coding, rheumatoid factor is produced, and the rheumatoid factor is going to target the IgG. It is going to um, start attacking it itself. As this happens, it, particularly in the synovium of the joints, where the body is attacking itself and fighting its own cells, and we have cytokine tumor necrosis factor that becomes activated. So if you picture the, the, this is the small joints of the hand, we have our normal antibodies that are, are present, and that rheumatoid factor starts attacking them, it, the autoantigen is present. It, it starts attacking those normal synovial cells. Well, our cytokines, they're kind of like the little messengers that go out and give the different information, and it increases more of a specific one called TNF that says, okay, we have, you know, a foreign body here. Let's go out and attack it and clear it and clean it, forgetting that it's part of itself because this RF factor is saying, no, this is a foreign body. So what we have is a process occurring down in the joints. We have um, increase in osteoclast activity. The leukocytes are breaking down the synovial layer of the joint. We have that articular damage and erosion that is occurring. And as this process and breakdown continues, now we have more exposure of the body cells that if we think back to the original problem, the body is recognizing as abnormal. So it amplifies its response. It says, well, now we have more foreign tissue. Let's react even further to it. So we have um, more activating of this inflammatory response. The body recognizes the fact that, particularly in the, these joints in the synovium, that it has to um, kind of have its army, I picture, ready of B and T cells to fight this continuous stimuli that's there. So what starts to form is the body actually begins to keep a supply of B and T cells right there in the synovium of the joint, and it starts to combine with the breakdown, the byproducts of this inflammatory response, and that's what we call panis formation inside those small joints. And they, some of the research says the body starts to form almost a tertiary lymphoid organ in that area, because of the continuous cell activation, and that perpetuates this inflammatory response. So when they look at diagnosing rheumatoid arthritis, they're going to use a lot of laboratory tests to look at the inflammation rate, because that's what's primarily occurring. The erythrocyte sedimentation rate, the ESR, when our, um, when we have inflammation present, what happens to our red blood cells is that we have a um, greater binding to the red blood cells and they become heavier. So they're going to sink faster. So the sediment rate is going to be greater. So it's looking at this and it actually finds that, that there are a lot of conditions when ESR could be increased. So what they find particularly with rheumatoid arthritis is the C-reactive protein. It is produced in the liver when there is an acute inflammatory response. It's a little more specific of an indicator. So when your patient 
with rheumatoid arthritis is going to the physician and they're having different lab tests done, you are going to want to be aware of this and see if you could find out the results because if you see their levels are increasing, that may let you know they're in more of an exacerbation versus a remission. In terms of the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis, um, looking at the lab values, they're going to find that look specifically for that rheumatoid factor. It's a present in about 60 to 80 percent of the individuals um, looking for that antibody that starts this entire process. What they're trying to say is, okay, well, that's great if the person has clinical symptoms, then they go get diagnosed, well, some damage has already occurred. We want to be on the forefront of this and look sooner to try and diagnose it. So now what they're starting to look at, particularly if there's that familial tendency, is they're looking at um, anti-CCP. This tends to be seen in the blood about five to 10 years prior to the development of clinical symptoms before they're exhibiting that um, response. So they, if someone has a greater sensitivity to this, it indicates that they may be leading towards the development of rheumatoid arthritis. So the medical management may start to be different. The joint protection, maybe we're going to start sooner. And then another lab test that they look at is the ANA, the anti-nuclear uh, antibody. And these are looking for the antibodies that are attacking some of the proteins in the nucleus of the cells itself. Um, some is normal, we should have some present, but if we have a higher level of ANA, that tends to be more indicative of rheumatoid arthritis. So those are some lab values that you may look at to correlate with the different clinical presentations that you're going to see that we are typically used to being aware of. We're looking for those signs of inflammation of the joints, particularly the small joints of the hands and feet tends to be very uh, symmetrical in individuals because this is a, a systemic type of response. It's going to have the inflammatory presentation for the individual. I read a couple of studies that actually said when we think of small joints, we all tend to think of the fingers and the toes. I want you to be mindful of C1, uh, C2, the atlantoaxial joint. They've actually found that in about 83% of the patients with rheumatoid arthritis, that joint is also compromised within the first two years of their diagnosis. So you're going, my, my ergonomics background made me look at the neck also and, and question it. Um, so you also want to look at postural alignment for those individuals and your um, ADL and adaptive equipment, uh, kind of being mindful also of their head and neck alignment because those small joints are often affected too. When we look at the different joint deformities that someone presents with, with rheumatoid arthritis, we have several different classic uh, joint deformities that we want to recognize. What happens as we have that breakdown and inflammation of the synovium from this autoimmune response, we start to see deterioration of the joint surfaces themselves, which leads to subluxation, which leads to tendon shift also. So we need to consider in the hand and feet that our boutonniere deformity on the left-hand side here, this is going to be MCP um, hyperextension, IP flexion, and DIP um, hyperextension. So it kind of looks like when we used to make a little boutonniere, we used to kink the bottom of it. Um, and then swan neck is the opposite here where you're going to see that classic uh, kind of deformity of hyperextension at the um, interphalangeal joint and then flexion at the distal here for the individual. As these joints sublux, this is letting you know that we need to do some extra protection for those. Hitchhiker's thumb is another uh, presentation that we may see where that thumb is going to be MCP flexion and IP extension. So this is going to present a challenge for those individuals as those joints start to shift and sublux because the uh, structures are not supporting them. And then lastly, we tend to see what's called an ulnar drift. So if we look at the digits of the individual on this right-hand side, 
that these digits are all drifting at the metacarpal phalangeal joints down towards that ulnar side. So when we talk about adaptations for these patients, this autoimmune process is going on. So what we need to do is remove any external stress that may further push them into these joint deformity positions of the hands as well as the toes so that we're not um, contributing further to the dysfunction of those joints for the individual. We are picking up with rheumatoid arthritis and looking at the clinical presentation. The clinical presentation for rheumatoid arthritis, we looked at the um, joint subluxation that occurs from the synovitis, the inflammatory response. We also see complications of rheumatoid arthritis that are more systemic. So those immune complexes that are created, the body needs to, um, Avoid itself of those. And unfortunately, because it's an autoimmune response that the stimulus is very present, so are the byproducts. And what happens is that the endothelial um, lining of the different uh, blood vessels tends to become affected in individuals with rheumatoid arthritis. So we start to see um, different chronic inflammatory type conditions develop from this uh, significantly increased inflammatory process that's occurring. Uh, a couple of particular conditions that are complications of RA that I want to mention for clinicians, the rheumatoid skin nodules. If you're working with your patient for an orthopedic condition and they also have a history of rheumatoid arthritis, even if that's not what you're directly treating them for, I want you to be aware that as you're palpating those individuals, that they start to have nodules that are going to develop um, in many different areas of the body, but particularly on the forearm, around the scapula, and the sacrum, um, ischial tuberosities, Achilles tendon. We see the development of these uh, fibrous nodules of the necrotic tissue, which are all the residual inflammatory cells. And if they open up, that this can place the individual at an increased risk of an infection. So be aware that when you're palpating in those areas of someone with RA, what you feel that you could potentially misinterpret as, you know, a muscle spasm or heterotopic ossification, depending on the diagnosis, it may actually be an RA nodule. Also consider that there tends to be fibrosis of the lungs. Uh, it's a longer term complication for individuals who um, present with rheumatoid arthritis. So if they um, have that scarring that's occurring in the lungs, they may be presenting with shortness of breath. So be aware of that in your exercise selection for them. And then more systemically, we're going to see involvement of the kidneys as well as an increased risk of atherosclerosis. This is different than the atherosclerosis from, you know, the high fat diet where we have the plaque formation building up. 
In this case, it's that endothelial inside layer of the um, blood vessel that becomes damaged from the chronic inflammatory response, and that makes it easier for the platelets and other cells to adhere. So we're seeing an increase in atherosclerosis, increased risk of CVA, as well as myocardial infarction for these patients. When the eyes are affected, consider low vision. So when you're rehabbing your individual with rheumatoid arthritis, also bear in mind that they may present with balance deficits that may not be evident to you. If you are seeing them in you know, a well-lit environment, consider at night that the vision may be impaired. They tend to have dryness of the eyes, maybe some light sensitivity um, because corneal inflammation actually occurs. So this may contribute to the increased risk of balance and falls, or also consider even where in the clinic you're placing the patient. And then something that is being discussed in the research is a combination of presentations. And this is where we really need to look at our patients holistically, because a lot of times these patients are seeing us because of more of an orthopedic type, you know, category of problem, decreased range of motion, decreased functioning, pain. Don't forget that this is a systemic condition and um, be aware that these patients may be presenting what's called um, Felty's complication. It's uncommon, but it happens in some patients with really long-standing rheumatoid arthritis that they develop um, splenomegaly, um, neutropenia, so a decrease in white blood cell count and they tend to have an increased risk of pneumonia and skin infections. So this may play a role when you're goal setting for your patients, and sometimes it does become a little challenging for um, our population that has kind of long-term chronic conditions to, to pick those goals. So you may be looking at things like posture, breathing exercises, um, skin monitoring, range of motion to be able to accomplish that and adaptive equipment. So my goal, one of my goals today is to try and get you to think outside of the box with this population in terms of how we can holistically manage them. And the medical management that the physicians are utilizing is really looking at that relief of the symptoms as well as preventing the organ damage that can occur from the systemic inflammatory process. Specifically, dietary modification is coming up as an option for these individuals. We're actually nutritionally dependent um, for our omega-3s. And these omega-3s in our diet are going to decrease the um, inflammatory mediators. So those are the cytokines. So it's going to decrease their production. So by doing that, it's going to, um, so the messenger that says, okay, B cells, uh, you know, start that inflammatory process. Uh, the synovial cells that contribute to that uh, inflammatory process. If we can have less of that mediator that triggers that response present, then maybe it's another way we can tap in to manage these autoimmune system uh, dysfunctions. So our omega-3 fatty acids are going to be like salmon, tuna, trout, because our body actually does not do well with converting the plant to a usable format. So the uh, marine-based omega-3s are really showing the best results in the research. And in a couple of studies, they looked at individuals who used uh, one-third of their diet with the omega-3s and then two-thirds with you know healthy fruits, whole grains, things of that nature. And they actually found that there was decreased time to fatigue. They were able to utilize uh, decreased pain medications. And actually, the tumor necrosis factor levels were coming down in these individuals, as well as many other the inflammatory mediators. So it's showing some progress that diet can play a role. And I think it's also important, too, you have to work with the physician, obviously. Um, it, when it's, we have to look at our scope in recommending these things. But it may be a way to empower the patient to try and give them a sense of control and other things they can try. When we're performing our exercise programs with individuals with rheumatoid arthritis, we really want to be cautious in looking at that joint subluxation, that we they are going to fatigue more quickly. And there's a lot of discussion that we want to consider the psychosocial piece, that um, the individual may have challenges with ADL, so they may not be able to dress and groom appropriately. They may not want to go out in public as much. That may decrease their activity level. And we said this is systemic. Think of that atherosclerosis risk, that renal compromise, that increased risk of potential um, 
lung compromise. It all starts to interconnect. So be aware of these things in your assessment of your patients and look for opportunities to include maybe a social piece and address their ability to participate in their ADLs and their, and their hygiene also. Uh, the Centers for Disease Control actually puts out a suggested uh, management protocol for individuals with arthritis and they actually have a really great program online that individuals can participate in looking for uh, group activities. They're obviously recommending more of a non-weight bearing, um, aquatics type of activities, really have individuals pay attention to their level of fatigue and pain, resting after 30 minutes to not exacerbate. Uh, and all of the links to any of the research studies I reference or the clinical trials or, or assessment tools, I did include a sheet at the end of the course notes with links to all of those resources. There are many different assessment tools that the physicians are going to utilize to assess your patients with rheumatoid arthritis, and they are validated for their use. Um, we are only going to discuss a couple of them, but I wanted you to at least see the names so that if you do have an opportunity to communicate with the physician, that you can maybe get some of this information that'll give you better perspective on where your patient stands in terms of the progression or the um, if they're in a remission for rheumatoid arthritis. The school that we're going, the tool we're going to look at first is the DAS 28. This is the uh, disease activity score. The physician is going to look at 28 joints, the small joints throughout the body for swelling as well as tenderness. And then they're going to also provide uh, global scores for overall um, functioning. They're combining these um, symptom piece with a pain scale as well as lab values. So they're looking multifaceted for correlations of function, lab markers, imaging results with the patients to um, really optimize the treatment and see what's making an improvement or if the patient is plateauing. When we consider how we're going to utilize the information, they actually use a definition of rheumatoid arthritis of remission, looking at this particular scaled score. And if your patient is going to the physician, you should ask for what these values are. So again, it gives you an idea for the patients. Generally speaking, um, if they're newly diagnosed, every month this reassessment is going to be done by the physician. And then if they're under tight control, about every two years it's repeated. And what they find is that on the simple score, a score lower than 3.3, and then uh, a score of under one in each of these following components indicates the individuals in a remission. So that may let you know that you have an opportunity in clinic to be a little more progressive in advancing that patient. Looking at the tools that we can utilize as clinicians, the uh, DASH, the Disabilities of the Arm, Shoulder, and Hand Questionnaire. This is a self-assessment questionnaire monitoring uh, the patient. It has 30 different items on it, and it's going to ask them questions about um, their ability to participate in different functional activities, looks at the symptoms they have as well as the impact on their function, grading things from I have no difficulty with this particular task to I am completely unable to do it, things like washing your back, let's say. Um, and this has uh, a minimal clinically important difference of a change of 10 in the overall score for this test means that there actually has been an improvement or a decrease in performance for the patient. So once you, you total that up. The five times sit to stand test, this is an easy test that we can utilize to help quantify kind of the functional change of transitional movements that someone may be having uh, to consider their function and how their rheumatoid arthritis is impacting their ability to perform that sit to stand. So what you're going to tell the patient is they're gonna be sitting in a straight back chair about 16 traditional inches high. And you're gonna say, what I want you to do is stand up five times as quickly as you can when I say go. So what you're gonna do is time on your watch or phone uh, how long it takes for them to perform 
that five times sit to stand. And what they're finding is that particularly on patients with rheumatoid arthritis, that this test has a really good correlation with the manual muscle test scores, with other disability measures, and particularly looking at the 50-foot um, walk test, so how long it takes someone to walk 50 feet. They're finding a good correlation in scores that if someone um, is taking longer uh, than 13.6 seconds to do our, our sit to stand test or 50 minute, uh, 50 foot walk test, um, that it shows that they are an increased risk of falls in a lower functional level. There are different smartphone apps that are coming out to allow patients, again, empower them, allow them to help monitor um, their symptoms. In early 2017, um, some researchers in New Zealand pulled all the different RA apps that are out there, and um, they compared them to the American College of Rheumatology and the European um, league's guidelines on how to monitor rheumatoid arthritis, and they particularly found that this arthritis power one, not suggesting it, just saying what the research found, is that of the 19 apps that they looked at, that this particular one, it looks at not only the symptom tracker, so looking at those like 20 common swollen joints, but it also gives a composite measure to look a little bit more closely at their um, function. So this may be something that someone can use as a self-monitoring tool. It, as clinicians, what we're going to consider when we're rehabbing our individuals, one piece of this for rheumatoid arthritis is going to be projecting that joint that is at risk for the subluxation because of the deterioration of the um, joint surfaces, as well as energy conservation techniques. Um, joint protection, OTs tend to think a little more readily of these things, but for the rest of us, um, look at the grips that we're using on the different pieces of exercise equipment, but they may also be simple things that come up in conversation with our patient if they like to cook or how they're doing their ADLs. Um, if they're holding a pot, rather than using you know, one hand, they should be using two hands. If they look at using a utensil, I have my pen here, but instead of using that um, you know, three jaw chuck to kind of stir, they should be doing more of a cylindrical grasp so that they're protecting those smaller joints of the fingers. Think of something simple, even like trying to squeeze the toothpaste. That's going to place extra stress on those small joints of the hand. Maybe what they could do is use the larger joints. So put the tube of toothpaste on the counter, put the palm of their hand, and press. I almost think of similar techniques that I would teach someone with a spinal cord injury that does not have motor function as well distally. Some of those techniques to use the more proximal larger joints to avoid stress. Also with energy conservation, some things that we should tell our patients is they have to respect the pain. That is going to give them feedback on their limitations. That um, they shouldn't be starting a task that can't be stopped until they understand their levels of fatigue and endurance and pain patterns. It's okay to delegate and ask for help and to prioritize, you know, even their ADLs getting ready in the morning, like yes, do what I have to decide, you know, maybe do you want to do your makeup or your hair? Which one for that individual is more important first so that then if they do become fatigued or they, they can't continue, they can stop but still be personally satisfied to some degree. Adaptive equipment that we're going to look at are larger, thicker handles for these individuals to take the stress off the uh, small joints. Think of just modifying things. Maybe um, for detergent, use a soap dispenser that then they can press with their hands so they don't have to lift and, and turn a, a large uh, bottle of of dispensers, looking at optimizing and distributing their load. Even so, something something as simple as instead of trying to hold, you know, a glass that may be difficult because of their grip, maybe a mug would be easier to give them a hold, a handle, and then they can use the other hand to support. So a lot of times, working with our patients on these things is important and helpful. Pharmacologic management for this population, traditional management is looking at pain management specifically. 
So use of now non-opioid type of medications for our patients to modify their pain. You may hear things like uh, Ultram or opioids Dilaudid that patients are taking. Um, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, patients who report that they're taking those over-the-counter medications, um, Aleve, Advil, Motrin, be aware that uh, they should be monitored for GI compromise. And then corticosteroids are looking at um, modifying those uh, macrophages and neutrophils and that inflammatory process. Some of these patients may be on low-dose steroids. Where the research is really leaning is looking at what's called disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs. These are biologics, and biologics are sim very similar to the normal cells in our body, and they are actually immunosuppressive medications, and they're going to target different phases in that whole process of the pathophysiology that we talked about in order to control that autoimmune reaction. And I'll just go over a couple of examples. Uh, a lot of times now we hear them on the TV, right? So your patients may come in that they heard of a particular medication. So you want to know a little bit about it. Of course, they're going to follow up with their physician, but just to give you a little uh, discussion. So methotrexate, we hear a lot on the uh, TV. Um, and what this is looking at is looking at um, regulating the T regulator cells. So there are actually um, adenosine receptors on the synovial cells. And by targeting those synovial cells specifically, they are better able to communicate with the T regulator cells to to not to kind of dampen or not react to those synovial cells as the foreign foreign matter. Another one you may hear of is uh, the brand name is going to be um, Humira. This is another biologic type of medication, and this is specifically looking at the protein, so that cytokine messenger. So it's going to block the functioning of that messenger cell, so it is not going to tell the leukocyte to even come to the area to try and initiate that synovitis. And I am most definitely oversimplifying the process um, intentionally, just so that we have a little bit that we can communicate with our patients and understand for ourselves why one patient's on something, another one's on something else, because they're looking at different pieces in the process. Um, for our individuals. The emerging type of medications that are utilized are the JAK inhibitors. These are looking at, they first started in uh, 2012. Um, the FDA uh, said that they can be utilized or, or analyzed, I should say, for utilization to try and control these JAX proteins. These are actually normally occurring in our cells. They're actually internal within our cells, and they are going to um, provide the instructions to the, D to the um, cells so that they can um, kind of give out the instructions in a more broader sense to many different types of cells. And they said, well, if we can even target earlier in the process, kind of like the um, cells that are giving the main instruction that are located very close to the DNA, then we can have a more broader reaching um, effect on not only the signaling, but the leukocytes, the T regulators themselves, and then that overall immune response. So we're starting to see that in Europe, these are being utilized. Uh, Zelljans is a current FDA approved one. Eli Lilly is emerging with their own brand. So we're going to start to see some other types of medication. Overall, what happens with all of these different anti-rheumatic drugs is that they are our autoimmune response is overreactive, so they need to calm it down. The challenge is they're trying to do that selectively because if they do not do that selectively, then the patient's going to have other confirmations, complications from other pathogens that they're encountering. And this is where we really play a role in kind of looking at those potential um, complications that arise from the management of the original pathology. 
So what they're looking at is that there tends to be an increased risk of opportunistic infections in individuals that are on some of these biologics. Have you heard on some of the commercials where it says, um, for people living in the Mississippi River Valley, which I had to look up where it is, they may be at increased risk of fungal infections. Now you understand why, because they found that these particular fungal infections, well, the specific, you know, cytokines or the specific leukocytes that target that also play a role in the rheumatoid arthritis and the medication is shutting them down. So now when that fungus is, fungi is present, the patient can't fight it off. They're also finding individuals who are taking these biologics, they're finding that they actually have an increased risk of hepatitis B reactivation, tuberculosis, and shingles. Because again, our typical response to fight th that off is being blocked because the consequence of it reacting for the rheumatoid arthritis is greater or more um, needing to be addressed at this time versus these potential complications that we can look at the patients and monitor them for and be proactive related to. So these patients should be getting the shingles vaccine because herpes zoster tends to be becoming um, reactivated. That these individuals, if they start to have respiratory compromise and they potentially could have been exposed to tuberculosis, you should be making that referral for them. So be aware of this, that that B cell response is going to be hindered because of the anti-rheumatic drugs that places them at increased risk of these other infections. This particular image, which I thought was really neat, is uh, that's MRSA in the yellow being ingested by a human neutrophil. The advances that they're looking at related to rheumatoid arthritis are multifaceted, like all the conditions that we are looking at. We are going to consider that um, they're looking at, as I said, the genetic components, the um, different types of medications and clinical trials, as well as better trying to understand the process of how the disease presents so they can look for more ways to jump in. What they are utilizing are um, adipose tissue now. To They're researching that our stromal cells in this emerging field of regenerative medicine is that the adipose tissue tends to be a good source of human adult stem cells. And they're finding that if they extract some of those stem cells, that they can um, manipulate them and redeposit them back into the individual's body. And in doing so, the individual may be better to auto self-regulate this inflammatory process in order to stop the autoimmune response. So they're finding that once they harvest it and manipulate and enhance the T regulatory cells, that when they redeposit them back in the individual's body, 
that particularly in the mice studies that they've done, that they are better able to um, recognize self and not initiate that inflammatory process. So many interesting things that they're doing related to rheumatoid arthritis. And then another autoimmune condition that we're going to look at now is lupus, systemic lupus erythematosus. There's say approximately 200,000 Americans, majority, 90% are female, do present with this condition. And it tends to be individuals with an onset between the age of 15 and 45. Like RA, it is a systemic inflammatory condition that has relapsing remission related to it. And we tend to see widespread inflammation occurring throughout the body. So think of this when you relate it to diagnosis. Again, with the, these patients that we're looking not just at the body region we're treating, we're considering all of their different systems. Understanding the pathophysiology related to lupus, it is specific in RA, we looked at the fact that it was more the cells that were being mediated where the problem was. In lupus, what they found is it's more inside the cells. So inside the cell nuclei, um, particularly the DNA proteins, they're finding that there is um, a recognition of those particular components of the cells as foreign. So it truly is autoimmune. It is like the, the cell itself that the body is recognizing as foreign. So what happens in this particular process is as it goes through the process of attacking its own selves, it again is creating these immune complexes that when the body tries to clear these immune complexes, it has to look for places to put them. So it starts depositing them elsewhere throughout the body. Specifically, there's something that triggers apoptosis. Apoptosis is um, cell death. So different cells throughout the body, something, we're still trying to figure it out, triggers the death of those cells. So when those cells die and they kind of open up and their internal genetic material is released, that's the autogen. So now that becomes exposed. So once that becomes exposed, that autoantigen is present. So that internal genetic material of each cell. So what happens is this is where the body recognizes that as foreign. So it is going to initiate an inflammatory response, trying to bind the matrophages of breaking it down, trying to remove the debris and the immune complexes. What happens is, again, as more cells die, there is more material to remove, and it kind of perpetuates this B and T cell immunity inflammatory reaction, and we have an ever-abundant supply of the precipitating factor. So again, the body is trying to fight itself. What happens over time is that these um, byproducts the body needs to get rid of it. And again, it starts to deposit it, particularly in the endothelial levels when we're looking at um, lupus. So in the endothelial layer inside our different blood vessels and our kidneys, um, our different organs throughout our body, our central nervous system, that it's released in those areas and deposited. Well, now you have that inflammatory process, those byproducts being located in different areas throughout the body. So those, let's say the blood vessel, well, now it sells, well, now I have an inflammatory response that I need to initiate here because I have something foreign infiltrating me. And we see that cytokine production, that phagocytosis, as it tries to clear now in this other region of the body, maybe it's the kidneys, tries to clear this inflammatory process is initiated. So we have this cascade of events in diff mul different multiple areas of the body, and we have inflammatory, they call it a complement cascade. So it's all the different cells coming in, the mediators of the inflammatory process, where the body is using a normal process, but the problem is it all started because it didn't recognize itself correctly. So it continues to self-perpetuate.
and that is happening in several different areas of the body when we look at someone who's presenting with lupus. So the dysregulation is um, significant in these individuals. What they're looking at is potentially interferon is playing a role. And interferon, um, in an oversimplified way, is going to be located on the uh, cells. It is going to play a role in, again, those T regulator cells recognizing itself in the leak leukocytes, knowing when they should and shouldn't react to different cells in the body. It's a protein that's secreted. And what they're finding is that interferon may play a role in trying to modulate this response, that it's a way where they can tap into a different point in the process. Looking at the clinical presentation, this is why individuals with lupus presents with many different symptoms. The primary symptom that you're going to see is the polyarthralgia, so pain throughout multiple joints, the polyarthritis, inflammation throughout multiple joints, and then the muscle pain. Lupus tends to be um, diagnosed uh, through exception uh, to some degree, that they need to rule out other conditions because the symptoms are similar. The difference between um, lupus and rheumatoid arthritis in terms of the arthritic component that's presenting is that um, in lupus, we say that the arthritis is transient and migratory. It's not always the same joints. It's not always symmetrical for those individuals, where in rheumatoid arthritis, it, it is. It's more predictable pattern for the individual. Something also to be aware of, because um, diet may play a role for these individuals, that if your patient is complaining or maybe you're noticing um, different oral movements or their speech is off, that actually oral ulcers are very common in individuals with lupus, that in the um, posterior half of the palate as well as the buccal membrane, they start to get ulcerations. It may not be something that they talk about, or maybe they don't even realize it's related, and they may need a referral back to their physician to address it because then their dietary intake is different, and we can have a cascade of effects that occur there. Also be aware that um, individuals may start presenting with pleurisy. Pleurisy is we have um, an inflammation that's occurring of the um, pleura, uh, which is the thin layer surrounding the lungs, so they tend to get a little swelling and inflammation there, so every time they try to breathe, it kind of rubs those layers together, and they may start having what's called pleuritic chest pain, which needs to be differentially diagnosed. Um, it tends to increase with deep in inspiration, and then also when they're lying down or leaning forward. So be aware of this in your posture training or if the patient's complaining of a different discomfort as you're doing exercises or with their ADLs that, you know, have a mind's eye that it may be uh, the, one of these other complications developing. Also, um, we can see a presentation in these individuals where they have involvement of the kidneys. Renal pathology can begin to present. So if the patient is maybe starting to tell you that they're not sleeping, they're getting up and going to the bathroom too much, um, that uh, we want to be aware of involvement of the kidneys so that we can make the referral back to the appropriate source. And one of my goals today, as I said, was to get you thinking beyond the typical presentation for these patients because we do want to treat them holistically because maybe that patient who it does have increased renal frequency or they do have renal uh, glomerulitis uh, starting to, glomerular nephritis starting to develop, Maybe that patient, if they also have visual deficits because of photosensitivity, uh, maybe we need to be aware of the lighting in their home and their balance. And if they have arthritic pain and they can't move quickly, that may put them at risk of not getting in the bathroom in time and increase their fall risk. So we want to be um, thinking broadly in terms of management for our patients. The malar and discoid rash are a presentation that we will see. This typical butterfly rash is a presentation that occurs with uh, lupus, and then the discoid is on the right. 
these rashes occur related to the photosensitivity and the alteration in the endothelial layers of the cells. The discoid is actually more of a scarring that occurs. And so maybe even think where you're placing this patient in the clinic. Medical diagnosis for lupus is multifaceted. Uh, the lupus um, collaboration internationally puts out these different uh, categories that are utilized to diagnose our patients. Just something to note is they can also present with hemolytic anemia. So the red blood cells are being broken down faster than they can be um, generated. So we may see increased fatigue, dizziness, pallor, that need to be aware of either for referral or to bear this in mind for our patients as we are working with them. The vascular complications that occur in individuals that present with lupus are going to be related to that compromise of the endothelial layer from those complexes being deposited and the inflammation. In particular, in addition to increasing the risk of stroke and myocardial infarction, these patients are at an increased risk of venal thromboembolism, so of deep vein thromboses. And what's different than our typical patients at risk for DVT is that for these patients, it's not inactivity that's the problem where we have the stasis that leads to the coagulation. For these patients, it's that damage to the inside lumen of the blood vessel that leads to greater coagulation and clot formation. So we're uh, being aware that our typical um, way of preventing it is not the same, so there's more of a medical management. When we look at the extremities of these individuals, because of that vascular compromise, I want you to recognize a couple of different skin presentations that you may see um, to distinguish a nodstery disease from levito reticularis. These patients are at risk of Raynaud's disease because it is a vascular spasm that's occurring distally in the hands and feet kind of a paralysis of the vasculature that doesn't allow the blood flow. It's usually in a response to cold. So um, for these patients, think about the weather, think about if they don't have the um, range of motion and function to put on the right socks and shoes, it may increase the risk of this. In this top picture with Raynaud's, we're seeing a bluish discoloration in the um, plantar surface and the toes because of the lack of circulation. The image below this, this is our levito reticularis. This is more of a um, netting type appearance we see here in the foot. And this is uh, the dermal ascending arterioles are actually um, becoming more mottled and the circulation is altered in them. And it actually looks like a netting effect in response to the lupus. Medical management for these patients is going to be what's called treat to target. This means they kind of use it for several different conditions. They're going to pick specific symptoms for the patient, and then they're going to look at monitoring those through exercise, diet, medication, and then see how the patient responds. Specifically, when you're rehabbing these individuals, what you want to consider, as we said, are the multiple areas that can be involved from the kidneys. Also be aware that about a uh, third of the patients they see do go on to develop seizure disorders, so monitor them for this. In terms of the nephritis, if you start to see bilateral distal edema developing, it may necessitate a referral back to the physician for analysis as well as um, a urine analysis to see if there is a progression deterioration. If your patients are pregnant or thinking about becoming pregnant who have lupus because it does occur in women of childbearing years, you want to make sure that you encourage them to speak really closely with their physician, even if their lupus is under control. Maybe you're seeing them for something completely different. Um, they need to check with their physician because they are at an increased risk of vasculitis of the placenta, which can be a complication during pregnancy. When we are looking at individuals um, with lupus, also bear in mind that they may start to present with headaches. Uh, so we need to look at, is it a headache that is due to vasculitis as a complication of the um, 
lupus or is it maybe more of a psychological stress or a postural reaction? So take headaches seriously in this population because there can be neurologic symptoms as the vasculature in the brain can become compromised. So be aware of um, paying attention to those headaches and doing a little differential diagnosing and referring them back to the physician. There are several different self-assessment tools that'll help you glean different information about all these different systems that are compromised. Because some of you may be listening to this and saying, gosh, I, I just don't think of the, the kid, kidneys or the lungs. You're not in working with that population, but we may start to see different patients, particularly as direct access is expanding nationally, or you're working in the health and wellness center as an, as an athletic trainer. So there are different assessment tools. The Salati is utilized to get information about all these different body systems. And it's a self-report tool um, with different uh, questionnaires about the different clinical presentations. It does have a high reliability and validity and it's very sensitive to change. So you can identify new symptoms or recurring symptoms for the patient. And what they're going to do is grade the different items like, you know, how well their vision is, um, how prevalent is their um, rash different things of that nature. And they are going to score each item item out for each body system when you look at the scores any score of approximately three to four means it's in an area that you should be looking at you should look more closely at that body system and then obviously refer out if it is beyond your scope once you identify that areas and either through medical management or the therapy we're providing we're trying to address those particular symptoms what you can follow up and do is the um, responder index. So then your follow up is, well, for those specific symptoms that the patient presented with, well, now let's not do this whole assessment. Let's tease those out. And on the next visits, you're going to have the patient say, well, do I have a 50% improvement in that symptom? 100%, you know, they look at those symptoms more specifically. So if you do need some type of grading or objective measure. And what they found is that particularly in this population, by doing this system of assessment of their symptoms and kind of scaling it down, that it does tend to be better able to identify small improvements or deterioration, particularly when you follow them over like a reassessment at six and 12 months. Exercise for individuals with lupus, they are saying that you need to be very aware of fatigue for the individuals, that it does play a role. And a couple of studies looked at a combination of either using more relaxation techniques versus more of your traditional type of exercise for the patients. And Again, we're looking at multi-system involvement, so the individual's ability to participate in exercise may vary over time, so you want to have other options. 
So they looked at individuals. Um, the suggestion is 30 to 50 minutes at a 60% max heart rate for three times a week. But if the individual has arthralgia and ki kidney compromise or the oral mucosal symptoms are exacerbated, they may not feel like participating in those activities. They may not be able to. So a, um, studies are looking at, well, what, what if we gave the person that exercise protocol and then they had another group participate in 30 minutes of relaxation techniques. They used a relaxation tape, they placed them in a dark room, and they actually found that 28% of the patients who did relaxation had some improvement in their symptoms, and 50% of the exercise group had an improvement in their symptoms. So it didn't necessarily work for everyone, but it may be another avenue for you to explore with your patients. Same thing looking at strengthening versus more aerobic exercise, that they found that when they compared individuals with lupus and they used more of a strengthening versus an aerobic conditioning, that both groups showed improvement. So maybe you want to try different things out with your patient to see what's best and combine that with education for them that it's important for patients to know how to manage their symptoms, how to recognize their symptoms, and shift from what they call more of an emotional reaction or an emotional um, balancing or uh, strategy to their symptoms to more of a problem-based strategy. So more emotion is they're going to have feelings of fear anxiety, depression, um, the individual may be just trying to talk things out, um, maybe they are just trying to suppress the feelings that they're having related to their symptoms, versus a problem-based approach is more looking at what is causing them the challenge at this time and what can we do to improve it, how can we get you more equipment or change the way you manage things or improve your symptoms to make it easier. And they've actually done some research and they found that patients who participated in this self-efficacy training, which is more the, the problem-based kind of being aware and problem solving and using social support systems compared to those who just um, watched a 45 minute video on how to deal with your emotions that at a six month follow up those with the problem solving had better symptom management. So something to consider in your rehab. Looking at pharmacological management for patients with lupus there are several different categories of medication the challenge with lupus is that until 2011, if you can believe it, it had been 50 years since there was a new medication to manage this condition. So I first read that and I said, how could no one think of trying to come up with a new medication for this? Well, what they said is that it's an intermittent condition, so it's hard to get your control groups for the study, and it's a small population. So to have a phase three trial, you need at least 1,000 participants. So it was hard for them to glean that. So what they found is now there are some new medications coming on the uh, market, and one of them that they are utilizing, um, it, the brand name is the Plolaquinil. And this actually, back in the 1600s, they, it's from the bark of a tree in Peru. And in the 1800s, they purified this. And then during World War II, they were actually having troops um, take this for malaria. And they found that they had decreased lupus symptoms. So over time, they changed the derivatives of it, and what they found is that can actually be beneficial in decreasing the clinical symptoms. They're finding that with individuals who are taking some biologics to try and target more of the B cells that are involved in this autoimmune response, that you have to really be careful. Um, Berlista is one of them that's on the Enlista. Um, if your patient says they're taking that, be aware that they can't have any live vaccines for 30 days. 
Um, so you have to be cautious if they say, oh, I'm going for my flu shot. Um, if they're particularly on this medication, they may kind of forget that particular piece. And then again, patients in general taking biologics, we have to watch for that reactivation of some other um, conditions such as hepatitis. Looking at research advances, they're trying to really find a good way to target different phases in the process. So they are looking at the DNA specifically, trying to look at bioengineered cells and see if there are changes that they can make. So one of the things that they're doing, and I don't know how the computer does this, but I was so fascinated reading about it, is that they somehow take like, um, they say it's a silicone microchip. And on that, they put the different autoantibodies and it connects to a computer. And then as they introduce the different um, biologics, they can look at how it's reacting and the computer analyzes it to see which has more of a positive response, which ones are not reacting with those particular autoantibodies. So at Stanford, they're doing some really interesting, interesting things. And then the AstraZeneca company has the TULIP program. So it's the treatment of uncontrolled lupus via the interferon pathway. So the interferon pathway is going to, um, if it becomes activated, it's going to increase the disease symptoms. So they're trying to look at how can we find those receptor sites for the interferon and give a biological marker to somehow block them to tap in and stop the process. They're, so again, they're looking at early, you know, diagnosing these conditions and managing the symptoms patients are presenting with, but from a pharmacological standpoint, they want to break into the process as early as possible or as in many different ways so that they can stop the damage and the deterioration because at the point that those immune complexes develop and are deposited in the different body systems, now you have multiple different areas that are impacted. So they're trying to target in many different ways these conditions. Now, talking about type 1 diabetes, Type 1 diabetes was previously known as insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus or juvenile diabetes mellitus. Normally, when we have a normal functioning pancreas, we ingest food, the nutrients and glucose enter our bloodstream, the pancreas uh, beta cells convert glucose into energy, they increase, in, they do release insulin, the insulin goes into our bloodstream, and is going to help that glucose migrate into our cells in order to be utilized for energy. What happens with insulin-dependent uh, diabetes, they're finding that there is a genetic mutation, particularly of that HLA gene, that they're finding is really responsible for encoding those T-regulator cells. And those T regulator cells are not functioning properly. They're recognizing the beta cells in the islets of Langerhorn in the pancreas as abnormal, and it starts attacking them and causing this inflammatory autoimmune response. What they found is that uh, how they know it's those T regulator cells, that's the point in the process where the challenge is for the individuals with type 1 diabetes, is that they looked at mice who spontaneously developed the type 1 diabetes, and they enhanced their T regulator cells, and then they saw a decrease in the disease. They alternatively took healthy mice, they deleted the T regulator cells, and they saw an increase in uh, the development of the diabetes. So they're seeing that um, that destruction of the cells early on, this is a juvenile um, development condition, that when the cells are damaged, those beta cells are unable to produce the insulin, then it's not present for that individual's life in order to allow the glucose to mod migrate into the cells for energy. So this individual is going to utilize insulin replacement, and they're going to have to regularly monitor their glucose levels. It's going to be a little bit different, the target levels for everyone based on their activity level and their food intake, so they work closely with their physician. 
These guidelines, uh, just to give you some general ideas, were developed um, from a nationwide diabetes assessment trial to try and come up with some norms that are utilized. But again, the patient's going to work specifically with their physician to look at their levels. And we want to be aware of these levels when we are working with the patient. that different activities can increase and decrease the glucose levels. And generally speaking, hypoglycemia is when all of the glucose has migrated into the cells or it's just not present in the blood. Uh, emia meaning blood, so low glucose in the blood. And then hyperglycemia is when the glucose is stuck out in the blood and it can't get into the cells. We need to recognize both of these conditions in our patients as with the pediatric population, particularly early on, they may not be great at monitoring their levels. So that's part of what we're looking at and how their body responds to exercise and activity. And then as that person ages, their needs may also change. So hyperglycemia in general is when the glucose is stuck in the bloodstream and it cannot get into the cells. That's either because they consume too much food and it's stuck out in the cells. They didn't do enough exercise to stimulate the utilization of the glucose. As many, as many other reasons, one is stress. So be aware of this um, as maybe you have an athlete who has well-controlled uh, blood sugars, but now they've had an injury, an orthopedic type injury, and they're stressed about school, about return to sport. This may change their body's utilization of the glucose and the insulin that they are injecting and it can lead to a potential hyperglycemic event because it changes our cortisol levels when we have stress and it makes us less sensitive to insulin so their insulin's not going to work as well. What happens is when we have all of this glucose stuck in our bloodstream and it doesn't have the insulin present to get into the cells to be utilized, the liver is going to release glucose which is further going to increase the levels in the bloodstream. If the insulin's not present, and if the door can't open to get into the cells. So now the body is going to start breaking down fats, which leads to ketoacidosis and byproducts that are being deposited in the body's system and potential coma and death. When we're monitoring patients for these symptoms of hyperglycemia, you're going to um, notice that kind of fruity smell on the breath. And sometimes in older patients, this can be um, confused with um, other presentations. So look for that fruity smell. They may have an increase in heart rate, shortness of breath, excessive uh, thirst as the body tries to clear the ketones, the byproducts from the bloodstream. If our patients have had an episode of hyperglycemia, because maybe we're seeing them as outpatients or if we're in the hospital, they weren't well, 
well regulated because of their medical compromise and we're going in to work with them in rehab, that if their glucose is extremely high, over 240, that we're going to be concerned about hyperglycemia and avoid exercising that individual um, and be cautious with them in the days following. Something else I want you to be aware of is scheduling your patients who have type 1 diabetes. There's something called the dawn phenomena, and this is normally occurring in all of us, that our body is going to increase its glucose levels uh, naturally, secondary to a hormone surge that we get in the dawn in the early morning um, hours, and that's going to trigger the body to release uh, the glucose, particularly the liver, to get us prepared for the energy we need for the day. So know that between around 3 and 5 a.m., they say for most individuals that they should really be checking that blood glucose level because it may change overnight, and then they have to watch their breakfast. So watch at the times you're scheduling patients early in the morning. If they're rushed and trying to squeeze in therapy, that it may alter their levels more. Hypoglycemia is going to happen when um, we see low levels of glucose. So for these patients, we need to give them the glucose. The insulin's present, but there's no glucose to get into the cells. So if they have increased physical activity, like during therapy, maybe they skipped a meal to come to therapy. So they're becoming diaphoretic, lightheaded. Um, what they need to do is consume glucose or simple carbs. Be aware that if your uh, patient also have kidney disease, that you do not want to use orange juice as the go-to um, supplement for them to utilize because there's too much potassium because of the kidney disease. Generally speaking, they say you want about 15 to 20 grams of glucose to be delivered when someone's in a hypoglycemic event, and then they should recheck in 15 minutes. To give you an idea of foods that kind of fall into that, about, they say, two tablespoons of raisins, a, a tablespoon of sugar or honey. Um, they even say eight ounces of low-fat or fat-free milk can give us enough glucose. So be aware of this. If your patient is participating in exercise programs and maybe they're becoming, um, you know, unsteady, they're demonstrating weakness, they're not following your verbal cues well, maybe they're leading to a hypoglycemic event. We want to be aware of this. We need to have the glucose levels well controlled for individuals because over time, if the glucose levels are not well controlled, then we are going to have um, the extra sugars that are going to need to be excreted through the body system or if they go into hyperglycemic events, releasing those extra ketones through the kidneys can place um, stress on that body system. So we're going to remember this does become a systemic condition over the life for many of these individuals. Be aware to include a vision assessment because the small blood vessels in the eyes can lead to a diabetic uh, neuropathy for them. Um, in, in addition to the neuropathy that occurs in the feet, you can have a retinopathy that is occurring in the eyes. So you want to watch for their balance. That visual system does play a significant role. They're also starting to see a relationship between different autoimmune conditions. And particularly with individuals with type 1 diabetes, they're seeing a relationship with thyroid disease. Our thyroid is responsible um, for regulating our metabolism and that the autoimmune response that causes the destruction in the pancreas, they're finding that sometimes the thyrocytes are also uh, compromised and that many individuals also develop thyroid disease. Now, the majority of them are going to present with hypothyroid conditions, um, weight gain, feeling cold, and lethargy, which again could relate, right? We could confuse that with fatigue from the exercise program they've started. So we need to look holistically at the patient and make our outside referrals. But some patients do present with a hyperthyroidism also related to their um, 
type 1 diabetes. So particularly in the pediatric population, you really have to be cautious because a lot of these symptoms for both of these could be associated with other conditions. But if you're keen, you might be catching relationships to make that referral to catch the thyroid involvement earlier. They're also finding that there is a correlation. There was an Australian study that followed um, 25,000 individuals. Uh, sorry, Swedish, not Australian this time. I like to go international. Um, that looked at individuals with type 1 diabetes, and they found that they were at a 40% increase risk of uh, also having a gastrointestinal autoimmune disease that is going to uh, present. So in these patients, you're going to monitor them for different types of inflammatory bowel disease, uh, particularly Crohn's disease is going to be an inflammation where they have um, patchy inflammation throughout the gastrointestinal tract. They may be complaining of frequent reoccurring diarrhea, weight loss, fatigue, um, maybe abdominal pain, decreased appetite. So rectal bleeding can occur. So be aware of this, that they, if they're presenting with GI symptoms or you notice they're mentioning to us because our patients talk to us that they're not eating as much or they're not hungry, um, that it could be the start of an inflammatory bowel compromise. When they're looking at managing these uh, conditions for patients, that they're looking at the fact that leukocytes tend to infiltrate in that intestine that we know plays a role in our immune response. And we have what's called integrins. They start to bind to the endothelial surface inside of the intestines, and that allows those leukocytes to cross into the mucosa, and that is disrupting that immune response, that functioning of the intestines, and then we have that sequela of response. When we look at diabetes management, type 1 diabetes specifically, medical management, the patient is going to need to utilize insulin, supplementation, and then they're also going to have uh, urine monitoring for those proteins and ketones in the urine that may be an indicator that their sugars are not well managed. The concern with this is that the kidney then is stressed, filtering out all those byproducts of the uh, processes so it can lead to kidney disease. The history of insulin as the primary management for diabetes is actually really interesting. The first mention of diabetes in the medical uh, history in the English language was back in 1425. Then it wasn't mentioned again for a really long time. And in the 1900s, the term insulin uh, was created. They were actually studying the pancreas, the island, of Langerhan, so insula, that's where insulin comes from. Uh, in 1915, they realized that when insulin is not present, that there were challenges. Um, the only treatment that they knew of um, was that they needed to try and modify diets. They were trying to restrict the glucose intake for the individuals. They weren't quite there with getting that. It's more that we needed to add the insulin so the glucose could get where it needed to be. Until 1921, what they found is that they used uh, canines. So they were using dogs first. They extracted dog insulin and they injected it into the pancreas um, of another dog that was not having a functional pancreas. And they found that the glucose was actually removed from their body system. So over the decades, this was uh, modified, and they started with purified injections into humans. They realized that um, we kind of have that lock and key mechanism where we need that insulin to bind to the receptors so that the glucose can enter the cells. In 1955, we had the benefit of oral insulin becoming developed to stimulate the pancreas itself to release insulin as much as possible, and then our advances are continuing with insulin. The mechanisms of delivery that we have available now, there's subcutaneous delivery between a syringe or an injector. And it's actually the pen injectors that individuals um, utilize are actually very interesting, that it's um, extreme pressure that's in the pen 
So when they inject it into the skin, the pressure kind of sprays transdermally through the skin, uh, the insulin into that area. They're also starting to coat the needles so that it's less painful if someone's using a syringe in order to inject the insulin for them. If you're working with the pediatric population, make sure that they have their insulin with them. Um, make sure that the pen does need to be refilled so that they're staying with their schedule. We're starting to see more patients that are utilizing the continuous subcutaneous insulin infusion. What this incorporates on the right hand side here, we see this is the uh, tool that's utilized. So they put the little um, kind of um, plastic nub with the catheter attached in this tool and then they attach it onto the skin. And then here on the left, we see we have this catheter going into the skin and into the unit. And then the little electronic component is going to release the insulin continuously into the patient for that transdermal absorption. Because insulin needs are going to fluctuate across the day, the system is continually monitoring the individual's glucose levels. And the patient kind of works with their physician to pre-program their delivery based on their diet and activity, but the unit is still monitoring, so it'll actually give them a signal if their levels are too high or too low, so that then they can go and do other um, intervention as needed and adjust their dosage. They have to still, two times a day, they should be still doing the finger stick in order to monitor their glucose. What they're looking at in terms of regulation of the glucose levels and getting a sense of how effective the insulin management is, but also trying earlier diagnosis of diabetes in general when we look at type 2. Um, looking at the A1C level, that's the glycosylated hemoglobin. Mostly our red blood cells live about 120 days when you average them all out. So some of everyone that's circulating are around 120 days and we keep replenishing them all. So what happens is when our um, glucose is not well managed, it is going to blind to the hemoglobin on our red blood cells. And then the A1C test is actually taking a blood sample from the individual. It's looking at the hemoglobin with the glucose attached, and it produces a reading of how much is attached. So how much extra was left right, in the blood to give us an idea over the past several months how the management of the glucose has been. That's why it's over time, because some of those red blood cells are still circulating for two to three months. So the National Diabetes um, Association says that around 7%, the target below 7 is what we're looking for. Um, they say that many individuals struggle to actually achieve that, but that is the goal. And the government is trying to help us in our efforts to be more aware and uh, better manage our glucose intake. So food labeling has changed. Right? When we go out to eat, we see this. It does make me um, try to think about this. So food labeling has changed. The regulations have been altered to allow us to get better information from our products, to um, meet the needs of many different individuals with different conditions, because they are finding associations between diet and a lot of different um, chronic conditions. The current food label up to this point was over 20 years old and it needed some work. So last year, moving into next year, we're really seeing changes in food labeling. So particularly food labeling, and these are manufactured products when you go to the grocery store to shop. On the left-hand side, this is the original label from 2014. And on the right-hand side, this is our new label in 2018. And I encourage you, when you go to the grocery store, kind of look around at them. So what they found is that they took away the calories from fat. They found that that really isn't making that much of a difference in um, our diets, or it's not having enough of an impact that it is changing the prevalence of different diseases. So they took that away and they found that um, what does tend to be important, looking at the different vitamins that are present, it used to be A, C, A, and C that were listed. 
Now they found that that vitamin D, you'll notice, is on the labels. Now we know why. And um, also looking at potassium. Potassium, they found, plays a significant role in hypertension and regulating blood pressure. So that's something that more individuals are monitoring. So they are making uh, manufacturers include that on the labels. Looking at a zoomed in version of our current labeling, what they're finding is that the largest thing here are the calories. So for calorie management, that is the first thing that's bold there and large. And they're actually including, when they look at the daily values, they're actually including percentages for the different vitamins and minerals as a percentage. So actually what is included in that particular product. Related to diabetes, what they have found is that you really need to decrease the sugar intake. So this is a significant change that has occurred in the food labeling. When we look at the food label, it now includes total sugar and then added sugar. So that is the new phrasing that's utilized. So total sugar is the entire amount in the product. Added sugar is, in addition to whatever is naturally occurring in the ingredients, what has been added. And that's everything from syrup to honey to concentrate to fruit, everything that's being added. And this, again, is helping individuals make better decisions in order to regulate their diabetes as well as other conditions with their intake. Serving size. The next time you're having a rough day and you get a pint of ice cream and sit down, to me, it's a pint. It fits in the hand when you're on the couch, right? You're not going to get up to put the rest of it away. It'll melt and it's garbage anyway. Might as well eat it. So it used to be that a uh, um, half a cup was a serving size. The reality what they found, so you'd have four servings in that pint. The reality is that they're finding is that people eat a lot more that our serving sizes are different. So new serving size, they're saying that that one pint, you know, is contains more servings. So they're doing some of the math for you so that you can more readily calculate how many calories are in something. And where you can see it more specifically is in soda. So whether it's a 12 ounce or a 20 ounce, if you look at the calories, they did the math. So that 20 ounce, that is one serving. So it'll have the total calories, total sugar, total everything for that. The 12 ounce is one serving. So all the math is done for you based on that. So again, they're trying to help people make better decisions more easily. They also recommend using the plate method for looking at a healthy diet. This helps us limit our uh, consumption of carbohydrates. Do you, you know, if I implore you to go in your cabinets when we're done, or if you're mobile, look now. All, like when you buy a set of dishes, it comes with those huge, beautiful plates you get at a restaurant. And it is massive. I take those and I put them away immediately. We don't eat on those. We eat on with the dessert plate, the salad plate, because a nine inch plate is a typical plate size. So what you should be doing on the plate for someone, um, for all of us, but particularly individuals with um, diabetes, they say that about 60% of the individuals with diabetes are overweight and about 40% of them actually have hypertension. So they really need to look at dietary factors. So the way the plate should be set up is you cut it in half, and that bottom half of the plate should be our fruits and vegetables, our vegetables, particularly non-starchy vegetables. So broccoli, green beans, tomatoes, zucchini, so non-starchy vegetables. Then we have one quarter of our plate that is going to be our protein component. And then we're going to have one quarter of the plate that really should be the different whole grains for our individuals. And then you're gonna have your milk and your fruit separate to that. So they found that the plate method is helping individuals. They've also found that um, healthy fat, healthy oils are more beneficial to include in the diet. So the way that you figure out if it's a healthy fat or not is they say if it is liquid at room temperature. Um, so oils that are liquid at room temperature tend to be um, healthy for us.
looking at type 1 diabetes and exercise. Uh, there are exercise uh, guidelines that are out there because we want to decrease the cardiovascular profile for these individuals uh, to get cardiometabolic improvements uh, because a lot of the morbidity is related to the cardiac compromise from that endothelial damage that's occurring, decreased blood pressure, decreased body weight. Um, for individuals. So they're saying that a healthy exercise program is beneficial. They've also found that exercise helps control those A1C levels, which is our indicator of how effective glucose is being managed over that three month period. So the recommendation for an adult is that 150 minutes of accumulated physical activity a week. And the way for our population to explain this a little easier is that they should go no more than two consecutive days without exercise, okay? So that gives patients a little bit of a guideline versus this complex 150 minutes a week, how to figure it out. Um, they have said that about 60% of the patients with type 1 diabetes are not doing any type of physical activity. So th that give it per couching it as no more than two days a week without exercise makes it a little easier for them to understand. Considering research advances related to type 1 diabetes, the shift in the research is changing. It used to be that they were trying to complete immunosuppression. They were trying to stop those T and B cell responses, which is what we're seeing with a lot of the other conditions we talked about today. But they're moving away from that immunosuppressive strategy with type 1 diabetes. And what they really want to do is develop the Tregs. They want to try and stop the damage before it occurs. Several ways that they are trying to manage type 1 diabetes. One is with an artificial pancreas that they're looking at an external sensor combined with an effusion pump, that an artificial intelligence that's going to try and regulate and predict just our insulin needs for that, this population so that it can deliver the appropriate levels. So that's something we may see coming out. Other advances are looking at antigen-based therapy. So they want to stop the damage to the insula before it even happens. Preserve those beta cells. Preserve that in the first place. So what they're saying is, well, if this is an autoimmune response, well, what if we taught the body to be tolerant of the beta cells and of the insulin? So they theorized in neonatal development that between about nine months and two and a half years is when we start to develop all of our own antibodies. So they said, well, what if we slowly through the mucous membrane, they started introducing insulin to um, the babies to kind of engage that pathway to develop a little bit more of a tolerance in the immune system of the presence of insulin so that it will not destroy those beta cells. So in mice models, this appears to be working. And in 2016 in Europe, there's a proposal for a trial that went out to enroll babies that have the HLA marker for type 1 diabetes to try this um, system to see if it's beneficial. Looking at interleukin therapy, interleukins are going to be responsible for helping stimulate those T regulatory cells. So if we can convince those T regulatory cells not to attack the um, beta cells, then we're going to preserve them. So what they're looking at, again, are different biologics and mechanisms to introduce low doses that are going to develop better T regulator cells so that they can more effectively control that immune system response. What I think is really interesting are these engineered T regulator cells. And it's like technology meets science meets healthcare is amazing. So they're doing a couple of different things. Looking at the engineered T regulator cells on the bottom here, this left hand image, we are looking at um, the disease-causing antibodies are in red. 
So, and those are the individual's T regulator cells coming in. So we see a lot more red than blue. So the T regs are not effective in eliminating the antibodies. What they're doing is they are specifically engineering T regulator cells that then can go out and look for, let's say the beta cells. And as they see the beta cells, what they, those T regulator cells then will do instead of attacking, what they're going to do is become protective and preserve. So in the right hand side here, they used um, the engineered T regulator cells and see how we see a lot more blue to control the immune response and protect the cells. And they're going to then um, preserve those beta cells. They're also doing um, some research using the umbilical cord blood in order to, um, what they do is they, they have this frozen umbilical cord blood and they are removing um, some of the cells. They are then going to re-inject that into the individual and the idea is that they're almost um, kind of re-stimulating the development of the immune response. They're kind of encouraging more of an immune tolerance to help decrease the incidence of those beta cells being destroyed. And then the last benefit that we're seeing or tool that's utilized are the T1 cells that can actually um, be transplanted from the islet cells. So what they're doing is they say, well, why can't we take the functioning islet cells out of one individual, or sometimes they're using um, pig, model, pig cells, and implant them into someone else, and then maybe that will stimulate them to develop new pancreatic cells that can produce insulin. So they're looking at the transplant network and they're saying, we just don't get enough pancreas in order to do transplants, why can't we just take a fragment of someone's and implant it to stimulate the development of new cells? And what they're finding in a cohort study of about 570 patients where they went in and they transplanted the cells from one person to another, they just use a catheter, they kind of go in through the liver, they found that 60% of the patients were able to decrease um, their insulin dependence. So they had at least 14 days a year that they, did not need to use any insulin. They followed them for two years out, so they were able to decrease their need for insulin um, significantly. Um, it wasn't long-term, so it's still in the research and development phase with the FDA. Looking at our last condition of multiple sclerosis, this is a neurodegenerative condition. So now we're shifting gears. We were looking at the pancreas and internal organ. Now we're shifting to another um, autoimmune disease that is more organ specific, except we're looking more at the central nervous system. And what happens is we normally have myelination of our our axons. So in our um, healthy axon at the top here, we have the 
myelin that allows conduction of the nerve signals, the insulation along there. And then in the bottom image, we have the destroyed myelin that then is not going to allow in the brain the conduction of the impulses appropriately. What happens in multiple sclerosis is diagnosis occurs again by ruling out other conditions because the symptoms, uh, there are many that present. So initially what happens is they're finding that the T, B and T cells that have become activated for whatever reason that want to attack the body itself, that when those B and T cells cross the blood brain barrier, and they enter the cerebrospinal fluid, that now they're in our central nervous system. And those autoantigens become activated now. So those autoantigens, now it is seeing that myelin sheath as foreign, because these B and T cells that are not functioning properly have gotten in across the blood brain barrier. So we start to have an inflammatory process the macrophages are rec recruited, it's targeting and deteriorating that myelin sheath that runs along the axon, and we have cytotoxic changes. So we start to see the cell deterioration, the macrophages are trying to clear the debris from the myelination, demyelination, and the inflammation may subside a little bit. So if our macrophages are successful in clearing the debris and the body is able to repair itself somewhat, we see that our oligodendrocytes are going to create a remyelinization of the cells, of the axons in the brain. Those are our specific cells that are, are responsible for producing that insulation, that myelin sheath. So it's great. It, re-insulates the nerve. It forms with a little bit more of a plaque that doesn't work as well. So it doesn't function as appropriately. And then we still have the other half of this process still occurring where those abnormal B and T cells are still looking at the myelin saying, no, you're not, you don't really belong here. We're going to attack and destroy you and clear you out. So we have that autoimmune cascade. What happens is we start to see actual changes occurring in the mitochondrial component of the nerves. So we have that whole inflammatory autoimmune piece, and then as the nerves try to remyelinate themselves and those plaques are forming, the axon actually starts to degenerate, and some of the research is saying that um, because the remyelination is not really effective, there's actually some mitochondrial injury that happens. So the reason these nerve cells are not conducting appropriately um, is multifaceted. This is an example of what it looks like on the left. We see nice concentric rings of myelin around the nerve cells. In the center, we are seeing um, through this electromyelograph, 
that we are seeing um, those nice concentric rings in the cellular material. On the right hand side, if we look here, there's more of a hollow space. We just see a thin ring occurring along these nerve cells, and that's what's happening in multiple sclerosis. So that's what's happening inside at the cellular level. How does this present clinically? What we're seeing is several different presentations because depending on which you know, nerve has lost its myelin, we're going to see different regions of the body that are impacted. And because those oligodendrocytes, you know, they're working hard to try and repair as the um, process is still continuing of destruction, that's why we see different forms of multiple sclerosis presenting. So some individuals have relapsing remitting where they have an exacerbation and then it is going to um, calm down when some healing has occurred and they um, then may have a breakthrough of the disease when the exacerbation occurs again because they're still figuring out the triggers for all this. Most patients have that presentation of multiple sclerosis, but there are other presentation where it they will have a relapse, but then they will have a recurrence of new symptoms that last greater than 24 hours. And then for some patients, it may actually be progressive where healing never fully occurs and they continually are deteriorating. When we look at the patients with multiple sclerosis, we're going to see that they are going to be presenting with symptoms in multiple different um, neurologic presentations. Uh, for some individuals, they are going to be complaining of paresthesias, so it might be like pings and needles in different areas of their body, or maybe um, a dyskinesia where they have an abnormal sensation, so maybe it's a burning or an aching that they have. Um, uh, Lermistes sign is when the patient is complaining of like an electric shock kind of down their spine into their legs when they have cervical flexion. The differential diagnosis for that obviously is going to be meningitis or, you know, is it a cervical radiculopathy that, or some other pathology. Uh, so if you have patients that are not yet diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, but they're having odd motor weakness, spasticity, uh, maybe loss of balance that when you look at it, it's more of a dysmetria pass pointing or a coordination loss and tremors. Um, that might be those indicators that multiple sclerosis is present, but they also could be symptoms of other conditions. So that's where referral back to the physician may be necessary. And if your patient is already diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, you want to know to monitor all of these different sy symptoms and systems for the patient. Recognize again the visual component because this plays a role significantly in balance and safety for the individual. Medical management for individuals with multiple sclerosis is going to be uh, multimodal. The MS Society actually did a study in 2015 and they surveyed patients because this is a lifelong condition for the individual and it impacts them in many ways as they continually become deconditioned that they said, you know what, that they're not really trusting the pharmacologic management, that they really want more options that are holistic. So that's where the research is going a little bit more with multiple sclerosis. So what they're looking at is again, that omega-3 and vitamin D supplementation for patients. Um, they also looked at a low sodium diet and one particular study said that when patients with multiple sclerosis had a low sodium diet, that when they looked at MRI scans, that they had less formation of new lesions in different areas of the brain and they had less development of new symptoms. So there might be something emerging there with looking at diet control. They also looked at patients related to that omega-3 and vitamin D supplementation. Um, they followed patients over a seven month period who had multiple sclerosis and they increased their omega-3 and vitamin D intakes because we know that they seem to be playing more of a protective role 
in our systems. And they looked at the fatigue scale for the individual, depression scale, as well as their labs. And they found that it was beneficial that they had decreased um, symptoms that were presenting for those individuals. So they also noticed that those individuals had um, improved functional outcomes. Looking at an emotional component related to um, multiple sclerosis, some considerations that we should have because the central nervous system is affected. And those of you working in orthopedics who may not be as versed in neurologic presentations, um, and even those of us who are, it might be easy to forget um, that there are so many different systems that are impacted particularly if you're not teaching, treating the patient primarily for multiple sclerosis, there's something called pseudobulbar affect. This is where it used to be called emotional incontinence, emotional lability. We see it in patients with traumatic brain injury, ALL, CVA, um, where the individual has an inappropriate emotional reaction that they're really not feeling sad, they're really not feeling um, depressed, but they tend to engage in in um, inappropriate, you know, crying or laughing that is really not fitting the situation and it truly is not effective of their mood. That they might say, I don't understand why I'm crying. I don't understand. And they're not a teenager just going through a teenage moment or the mom of a kid who left for college. Um, that these emotional changes have a really high toll and it has to do with the uh, dysfunction in the central nervous system. So what they're finding in terms of coping strategies, because you may not know how to react to these patients, is the suggestion is that you should try to distract them, um, maybe teach them deep breathing exercises, that sustained laughing and crying can physically create stress in the musculature. So they actually found that teaching the person to just change their body system, massage the particular muscles that are utilized in the crying or laughing to decrease that tension actually has some benefits in controlling that pseudobarbar affect. Also looking at exacerbations and remissions for these patients, because the myelin sheath is lost, it's not going to conduct as well. So fatigue and energy exposure, the nerve conduction velocity is changed. So these individuals fatigue a lot faster. So we need to be aware of this. And heat plays a role. Body temperature plays a role in temperature control and in the fatigue levels for individuals. So be aware that um, anything that increases body temperature potentially could make the multiple sclerosis symptoms, what, however the patient's presenting, worse. And it tends to resolve in 24 hours, but Uthoff symptom is that after someone has an excessive exposure to heat, whether it's sun, humidity, air temperature, maybe they're sick and they have a fever, or the exercise you're participating in with them, that it can increase their body temperature and increase their symptoms, and it may take 24 hours for that to resolve. So be, be aware of this. What they recommend for some patients is that as we are trying to monitor their fatigue during their exercise programs, and the majority of patients with MS, they say up to 95% of them say fatigue is one of the major factors, that you might want to measure their body temperature before and after exercise so that you learn their patterns so that you don't contribute to exacerbation and you can keep it submaximal. Also consider a Borg scale. So look at perceived exertion for these patients, not just quality of movement and quantity of movement, that you might want to look at um, the perceived exertion to keep them within an acceptable level of tolerance so that you're not over-exercising them, in addition to energy conservation techniques. Sleep disturbance is commonly reported among individuals with multiple sclerosis. Um, they found that the lesions in the hypothalamus disrupt the sleep-wake cycles for the individuals. Then we have the component of depression and insomnia potentially um, 
making that more challenging. So they did a study of individuals with multiple sclerosis. Um, it was just under a 500 person cohort, so good information. And they asked them the main reasons they're having difficulty sleeping. And what they're finding is that um, muscle cramps, urinary urgency and frequency seem to be contributing. So we can play a role here, looking at if it's spasticity that is increasing the muscle cramping at night, Let's do some positioning. If the urine, if they're getting up with urinary frequency and urgency, let's make sure they can safely get to the bathroom and then safely get back to bed um, in, with their voiding. Um, some patients, when they look at sleep studies for these individuals, they actually confirm that they do go into less REM sleep and that they actually have more waking up during the night. Uh, compared to the general population. So let's look at good sleep hygiene. I think sleep should be assessed on all of our patients because we want to see why are they not sleeping and are they things that we can modify and advice we can give them to improve their sleep habits. There are several different tools that can be utilized for our patients with multiple sclerosis to get an idea of their fatigue levels. The fatigue severity score is tested and utilized for patients not only with MS, but also rheumatoid arthritis and lupus. It's a nine item questionnaire, and it's going to ask them how fatigue is impacting their day. And if you have um, a ranking of one I strongly disagree to seven um, I strongly agree, looking at how different activities are going to be affected by their fatigue, it gives you an idea of maybe some goal setting. They say that if there's only a 10% change in their overall score over a six month period, that that's not clinically important, that you need to see greater than a 10% change for it to be considered a benefit. The multiple sclerosis assessment uh, quality of life tool this is going to look at the multifaceted impact of the disease on their life, not only looking at the physical symptoms, but the um, role limitations, the emotional impact, all of the different factors from the patient's perspective, perspective that go into quality of life. So there's no single score that's developed, but again, the subscales will give you some information on where you can target your goals for your patient to really be impacting their life in a way that is meaningful for them, as well as monitoring their symptom progression or improvement. There are apps that are out there to help patients, just like with everything, uh, assess their symptoms and continue to monitor them. So it might be something that patients can utilize to feel empowered. And then pharmacologic management. They're looking at different um, medications to limit the lymphocyte migration uh, to the brain. So they are looking at trying to control the exacerbations in that way. If the lymphocytes can't cross that blood-brain barrier, then they can't initiate this particular response for the patient. Um, Zinralta, you may hear, that is going to bind to those um, interleukin receptors. Again, trying to um, control that initiation of that autoimmune response. There are several different medications out there, and they are trying to look at updating the guidelines according to the Multiple Sclerosis Society to really have better medical management of patients. When we look at our patients who are on different medications for multiple sclerosis, we can play a role in symptom assessment. Uh, they are at a greater risk if they smoke particularly individuals who smoke, have multiple sclerosis, and are on some of these different um, biologic medications. They found that they're more likely to develop the progressive form of multiple sclerosis, so just something like smoking cessation education might be beneficial. And then in terms of research advances, again, it's really exciting the different things that are going on out there. They're looking at harvesting the individual's um, stem cells from the peripheral blood, and then they're going to preserve them. After that, they use high-dose chemotherapy to deplete the individual's immune system, hopefully you know, getting rid of the dysfunctional 
regulatory cells, and then they return the stem cells to the individual's body, and the hope is now they'll develop a more normal response in order to uh, pre prevent the progression of the disease. So they're looking at some different ways to try and help stabilize the multiple sclerosis with the hematopoietic cell transplants. Looking at diet for this population, they're also considering that low calorie, low protein diet may play a role. You may have heard some discussion that the periodic uh, three day cycles of fasting for some individuals can help control inflammatory systems. The research is starting to look at this. In terms of other dietary implications, in general for individuals with autoimmune disease, the short chain fatty acids are something that um, develops when soluble fiber is going to ferment in our body and it creates those strong mucosal intestinal bonds that is going to help our T regulator cells develop and function more appropriately. If the Western diet is not, you know, that high fat, low fiber diet, it tends to not allow for a lot of strong chain uh, fatty acids to be developed. So it deteriorates the mucosal membrane. So this is where the discussion is coming that starches that tend to pass unchanged through our small intestine into the large intestine, um, they're the ones that can generate these short chain fatty acids. So those are going to be your whole grain uh, rices, uh, whole grain cereals, certain fruits. Now you do have to watch individuals who are diabetes, if they say they're trying out one of these diets, that it may change their regulatory levels of their sugars. So we have to be aware of that. Again, patients mentions things to us and you might say, you know, are you monitoring your glucose levels a little more closely? Or if you're on a pump, did you adjust your settings? The Mediterranean diet has also been discussed as an option for individuals. Um, the, the, they say the bad Western diet increases the, those pro-inflammatory mediators. Uh, so they're saying that you know more olive oil and fish oil, uh, it seems to be better in this Mediterranean diet, again, for increasing those fatty acids that strengthen that mucosal lining. And then the Paleolithic diet, the idea here, they said that on our way from the Stone Age to the uh, agricultural revolution to the present day, we lost our foraging ability. So they've actually done studies where they put people out in Germany in the national park and they had them kind of live off the land. I don't know how they got volunteers for it, but they actually found that um, when they looked at different markers, uh, biochemical markers for these individuals, that they had decreased body fat, decreased inflammation, the insulin levels were more stabilized. So there's some discussion on looking at components of this diet as being healthy. Anti-inflammatory diet, you may have heard of in general, that there are certain foods that promote more inflammation, so you want to stick more with an anti-inflammatory diet. Um, we need um, certain omega-6s for our development, but we've already discussed that our omega-3 fatty acids can definitely be beneficial. High, pro uh, high whole grain fiber, they're finding controls that C-reactive protein and then certain oils they're finding are actually more beneficial in blocking inflammatory enzymes. So that's some of the science behind those different food ideas. And then lastly, you may have heard of the, the new uh, rage here, turmeric, which is the king of spices. Um, they're saying that this has very beneficial uh, control contributors to the inflammatory process and they've looked at individuals who are um, let's say in India, uh, Asian countries where they use more of this particular spice in their diet that it, in Ayurvedic medicine it's utilized in Chinese medicine because of its um, beneficial effects on modulating the inflammatory process 
because they're actually seeing decreased incidence of some of these diseases in countries such as India. So they're starting to attribute it to, to some of these spices. So you would think with all this great information that I eat a perfect diet, I sleep great, and I'm getting all my labs done, um, which may or may not be the case. Um, but what they're looking at as therapies and things like that advance, they're looking at nanotechnology um, as drug delivery systems that will actually go into the individual's body and they, um, the nanotechnology is attached to a T regulator cell that functions properly. They inject it into the person, the nanoparticle degrades, and this great, fabulous functioning T reg cell is there. So that's where the research is going. So as I eat my terrible diet, I'm hoping they got that figured out by the time I need it. Um, Hopefully not. Uh, not the, the best way to manage things, but hopefully today what I gave you is a good understanding of the different conditions that affect or several conditions that affect the autoimmune system, how and why they happen. So as technology continues to improve and pharmaceuticals improve, you have some good ideas and can better understand the research that you read, as well as you have some ideas for assessment and treatment of this population. Uh, any studies that have um, looked at the effects of GMO foods on the immune system, I'll be honest, that's not something that was popping up in the studies that I looked at. So I didn't look, do it the other way and look specifically for research on that. It's kind of like a whole other topic that's emerging specific to these conditions. I didn't notice anything, but again, I didn't read all the information that's out there. Does a lack of fiber along with vitamin D deficiency increase intestinal problems? Um, again, the diet piece is multifaceted. The research studies that I looked at just looked at the vitamin D levels itself and particularly looking at sun exposure because that is the primary, the UVB light is the uh, primary way that our body is absorbing the vitamin D. So that's where most of the studies that I looked at were directed as opposed to the dietary piece of it. Though the research is saying that vitamin D supplementation can be helpful. Um, there's different types of it. It's not as well absorbed um, for conversion and if it bioavailability, but they are finding uh, new ways to look at how vitamin D is absorbed. I just didn't specifically see or look for any references related to fiber. Question is, will sun tanning booths substitute for sunlight? 
There are different types of treatment that can be utilized for individuals to increase natural sun exposure, and it needs to be balanced with avoiding the increased risk of uh, skin cancer. So sun tanning booths, um, I'm not going to specifically address because I haven't really read all the research on it, but I can tell you that, um, Again, there needs to be that balance between delivering appropriate UVB light for vitamin D production at a sufficient level with not increasing the risk of the skin cancer. So tanning booths are a whole other entity that's not a therapeutic intervention, so I didn't, I didn't get into that. What percentage of patients are diagnosed with multiple autoimmune conditions at the same time, and are they at a greater risk of being diagnosed with additional disorders in the future? The research is looking at this um, because it, it may allow them to be ahead of the development of other conditions. They're finding linkages. Uh, for example, we'll talk about individuals who have type 1 diabetes because that's a pediatric condition, so they're looking ahead over the life of the individual. They're finding a connection with thyroid disease as well as um, gas some gastrointestinal types of conditions. So they are starting to see some linkages that are occurring with some of these different conditions, and the research is still emerging in that field. Because as we've been talking about, sometimes it's the same immune cells or components of the immune system that are targeted. But as we talk specifically at each condition, they're all a little bit different. So they're really, they're trying to tease it out and look for the parallels, look for the connections so that they can be most effective in the treatment strategies and diagnosis. If someone in the family is diagnosed with lupus, do I feel it is necessary to have the children and grandchildren um, tested? I didn't specifically look at the research in the genetic susceptibility related to lupus and what is the recommendation. I can say that um, genetic mapping is continually expanding and the research I think changes almost daily on these different topics. So I would say it's something you can do a little research on your own and then definitely follow up with your physician to see what tests are available um, to look for those conditions and a potential genetic predisposition. So if there are multiple family members diagnosed with lupus later in life and someone's ch tested during childhood, can they become positive later on? With these different conditions, particularly the autoimmune diseases, they're still trying to figure the relationship between, yes, there's a genetic component for many of them, but what triggers it? to become active. So particularly with lupus, we know that something causes the cells in the different areas of the body to break down initially and cause that internal nucleic material to be exposed that then starts this sequela of inflammatory response. They don't totally have it figured out as to what that trigger is. They tend to see development between 15 and 45 years old, but that's not where everyone falls with it. So it's another instance where continually following up with your physician as the research changes constantly to see what the best recommendation is for testing and awareness to try and catch these conditions early. Because they're always coming up with new information and new research on how it can be diagnosed. Not only looking at the genetic piece, but maybe other lab tests that can be an indicator. So can thyroid disease cause diabetes? The specific studies that I looked at just looked at the relationship and the combined presentation um, 
they didn't specifically look at exploring the pathophysiology of what came first. Um, in the majority of the studies that I read, the type 1 diabetes was first diagnosed, and then the individual later went on to develop thyroid disease. Again, I didn't read every study and didn't specifically look at it the other way. So the question again with thyroid um, cancer kind of fall under thyroid disease. Cancer is its own entity. The studies that I read did not address that. It looked at thyroid dysfunction, either hypo or hyperthyroid functioning that was attributed to the um, thyrocytes being attacked as part of that autoimmune process. So cancer is a, a separate mechanism that in the studies that I specifically read was not discussed related to the type 1 diabetes. Does light therapy help decrease MS symptoms? I did not find any specific research related to light therapy and multiple sclerosis. However, you do need to be cautious with sun exposure for individuals with multiple sclerosis because of their challenges with temperature regulation and fatigue, that uh, too much sun exposure could actually exacerbate the symptoms of multiple sclerosis. How would you know the difference between a nodule from um, rheumatoid arthritis and a trigger point? That is actually a great question. I haven't found any specific research that explains that. I would say that when we're palpating any patient, we need to consider what the normal anatomy is in the area and then consider what we're feeling. So a trigger point is typically located within a muscle and it creates a specific reproducible pattern of pain, whereas other nodules that someone may have, whether it's a cyst or maybe some heterotopic ossification um, or a nodule from rheumatoid arthritis, you're not going to feel that as muscle tissue. It's going to feel different and maybe be in a different location and not have that same reproducible pattern of pain as a trigger point. So you need to get more deeply into your differential diagnosis at that point. Does exercise help with autoimmune diseases? When we discuss the specific conditions of um, multiple sclerosis, type 1 diabetes, and also considering that uh, the systemic conditions can impact the cardiovascular system as well as the musculoskeletal system. There is research emerging that we need to be holistic in looking at the role of exercise in not only managing the primary diagnosis, but also the other complications that may develop. So there are research recommendations that are emerging for these populations um, in terms of the level of exercise and the types of exercise that can be beneficial in managing multiple aspects of their diagnosis. While the exercise itself may not change the cascade of effects related to what causes the immune reaction, it is being shown to be beneficial in managing some of the other comorbidities that the individual presents with the um, cardiovascular complications, for example, as well as giving more of a mental health component benefit for the individual. Does rheumatoid arthritis affect brain function? Um, looking at rheumatoid arthritis from the research that I had completed, it was not something that was emphasized. Um, it does tend to be um, more of a condition that affects the joints, the synovial membrane, but then it does spread out to impact um, the renal system. It does increase the risk of atherosclerosis, so we could extend that potentially if it's increasing the risk of a cerebrovascular accident. It does impact brain function in that way. 